So I wanted to thank everyone for joining. Um, so to kick it off, um, I was going to have Naomi Klein come and introduce the, the whole team and how this project came about and do a very brief intro, um, and then we'll, we'll get to it. So uh, Naomi Klein from uh, Westchester County. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Naomi Klein. I'm the Director of Transportation Planning for the county. And uh, we run the Beeline bus system, we plan for, we plan bus service, and we also take on a lot of regional planning initiatives such as bicycle and pedestrian planning and com complete streets and other uh, initiatives uh, to promote better transportation options within the county. Uh, so we've done these types of workshops before and we find they're really an effective way to bring people together in a community around a common issue and to work together to identify solutions to uh, addressing uh, the problems and the situation uh, being faced. And we've uh, engaged the consulting firm of FHI Studio. They're experts in complete streets planning. They've done these types of exercises uh, all, all in, in many different locations. Uh, so with that, uh, I'm going to turn over the workshop to our consultant, Michael Lehelin, and um, he'll talk about a little more about what we're going to be doing today and introduce his team. Great. Thanks, Naomi. Um, so we'll start with kind of the team introductions, and then there's a small enough group that I would love to hear all of your names and, and your affiliations. Um, so I'm Michael Ahillen. I'm a project manager with, manager with FHI Studio. Um, I'm also a transportation planner. Um, so thanks everyone for joining and taking your time uh, to, to help this, this very important project in developing safer, more walkable streets in Bronxville. Um, so just uh, an overview of the agenda. So we've already done introductions. We'll be talking about what complete streets are. We'll do a kind of a visioning exercise. And throughout this presentation, I want us to be participatory. If you have questions or comments or want to start a discussion, feel free. We've allotted time for that. Um, so, you know, if you have questions about complete streets when we're doing the overview, feel free to chime in. Um, we'll also be talking about Safe Routes to School, which is a program, a federal program um, that is very relevant for, for at least Bronxville and the study area that we're focused on. Uh, we'll talk about individual elements of walkable streets as well as do a virtual walkthrough of the corridor. So many of you, in fact, most of you were here uh, last week where we did kind of a site pre-visit of the corridor. Um, if you weren't able to attend that and you would love to, uh, you would like to do the walking of the corridor with the consultant team and some of the other project team members, feel free to join us at the end of the uh, presentation. So we'll do a small group activity. So at that point, uh, come up to kind of the tables. Uh, we encourage when you're kind of in the smaller groups to wear a mask. Um, and uh, we'll talk, do a mapping activity and talk through some of the, the elements that we talked about at the pre-visit, as well as new ideas and big ideas that uh, we, we've come up with um, since. So um, we'll report back and do a discussion of those big ideas, um, and then talk about implementation and next steps. Um, as far as what this project is and where it's really going is what we're doing is, well, it's about engagement. It's about consensus building. It's about getting ideas from community members like yourselves and community leaders. And just getting us all around the same table and on the same page on things because we're documenting this project through a report. And that report is really useful when applying for grants and ultimately getting funding for these projects um, so that they can actually be implemented. Um, so your participation is extremely important and it's a part of the process that really shows community support and interest in these sorts of improvements. So with that, I'll start with just an introduction and overview of complete streets. And raise your hand if you've heard the term complete streets before. Okay, so most of you. But, you know, it's, it's kind of a planner engineer term, right? So I'm kind of dissected a little bit and, and explain what it really means. So complete streets are streets that are for everyone, uh, no matter who they are or how they travel. Um, so the idea is that it's all ages, all abilities, and all modes. Is every street intended to be a complete street? No, not necessarily. We, there's a reason we have freight routes. You know, Truck traffic isn't allowed on every street. You wouldn't expect trucks on every street. However, complete streets can look a lot of different ways. Like a complete street could be like a narrow residential street because it serves all the users of that street. Or it can be something quite a bit larger. It could be four lanes. It could have bus lanes. It can, you know, if you're in a dense urban area where it might have bus lanes and protected bike lanes and wide sidewalks. So it looks in a, a lot of different ways. So one of the reasons we're all gathered here today is to figure out what a complete street is in the context of Bronxville. 
So we're aiming for all ages, young and old, all abilities, all modes, um, and it seems like there's new modes coming up all the time. I don't know if you've seen like e-scooters and e-bikes and, and those hoverboard things. You know, there's always new things. So we're trying to accommodate all those modes, which ultimately leads to comfortable, convenient, and safe streets. Um, so those are kind of the, that's kind of the aim that we're going for here. All right, so I want to do a little bit of a history lesson just because I think it places what we're doing into context. Um, so I couldn't find a, a really great historic photo of Bronxville, so I did find one in White Plains. This is Railroad Avenue, which I believe now is Main Street um, in White Plains, and this is what it looked like in about the 1920s. So what you're looking at is what we today would call a complete street. You know, it's, it's, it's dirt, so it's not paved. No vehicles are going more than probably 10 or 12 miles per hour. There's a lot of different uses on this corridor. I look at other complete streets photos from that era, and you know, there's people biking everywhere. If you see video footage of it, people are crossing the street whatever, wherever they want, because if you notice, it's a dirt road, and there's no crosswalks, right? So at one point, the speeds were low enough that it really accommodated all users just organically. Um, so not to pick on white plains, but this is what it looks like today, right? So there's, we've really transitioned more to a car dominated look on streets. And this might be a great use for this street. This might be the intention. We're not in white plains, so I can't really comment on it. But what it shows is this streets are starting to look like this over time. And when you look back in the historical context, how streets look today is really a blip in time. I mean, going back centuries, right? They've even found in ancient Roman ruins evidence of street calming. Like there has always been this desire to have slower, safer streets. Um, but particularly now, this idea of complete streets really has exploded because we're seeing a lot of roads like this and we're hoping to transition to that to safer, more convenient, and more comfortable streets for all modes. So why are we building complete streets? Um, I want to really frame it around three main points, which is safety, choice, and quality of life. Um, the reasons go on and on. You know, there's environmental reasons, equity reasons, public health reasons, economic development reasons, community resiliency reasons, you know, transit reliability reasons, congestion mitigation reasons. There's, the list just goes on and on and on. And if we wanted to talk about those, you know, feel free to ask questions. But what I'm going to focus on for this presentation are safety, choice, and quality of life, because those are really the big ones. OK, starting with safety. Um, so we need to bring, it's, it's probably why we're here. You recognize the street, probably. I built that sidewalk. I built trees in, I built the wall. Yeah. See, this is, we're looking for something that's really comfortable looking. I mean, this is an inviting sidewalk to me. You know, it's, it's really a comfortable looking. It encourages walking just from the aesthetics alone. Uh, so fantastic work. <laughs> um, so, but the other thing to note about sidewalks is they work. Um, there's a lot of data to support that pedestrian crashes decline with, with sidewalks, right? And it seems pretty logical, right? Like if sidewalks are present, people are going to use them, um, possibly more, and also prevent people from walking in the roadway. Um, in many studies, we're seeing a 65% to 89%. This was a federal study that was done. Um, when you add sidewalks to a community, that's how much the pedestrian crashes are decline. Uh, hybrid beacons, which um, is just a fancy term. There's different names for them. But like, for instance, a, like a rapid flash beacon that you might see, you see uh, Master 10 in Midland, right outside the school. Those can lead to huge declines in pedestrian class crashes. The study found 55% decline in pedestrian crashes. Um, where a beacon was present. Total crashes also decline, so it's not just about pedestrian safety, it's really about everyone. So for instance, some complete streets, transition streets, they do what's called a road diet, they transition streets from four lanes to three lanes. Um, this can really result in substantial declines in total crashes, as much as a 47% decline. Um, and then with, with the hybrid beacons, um, so as we noticed before, it was 55% decline in pedestrian crashes. Crashes overall are declined by 29%. Part of that is just slower traffic speeds, which is something I really want to emphasize. Um, this is a little bit of a heavy topic for maybe 9 a.m., but it's an extremely important one, and it's probably the number one reason why we're really here. Um, so when we talk about pedestrian safety, we also need to be talking about vehicle speeds, and this is why. If a vehicle is traveling at 20, mile, 20 miles per hour and hits a pedestrian, that pedestrian is most likely to survive. That's why you start, you see on a lot of neighborhood streets, you see slower traffic. You see 15, 20, sometimes 25 mile per hour speed limits. 
Look how much that jumps, um, the fatality rate jumps when you go just 10 miles per hour faster. So when we were doing our pre-visit, we weren't necessarily seeing vehicle speeds of 40 miles per hour kind of tearing through the neighborhoods. At least I didn't notice that. You may, in your experience, have seen that before. 30 miles per hour, though, I think that some of the cars that we saw were pushing that. When you jump from 20 miles per hour to 30 miles per hour, and if a pedestrian is hit at 30 miles per hour, they almost have a half chance of, of being a fatality um, in that instance. So it's a really important thing to maintain low traffic speeds. And then when you jump to 40 miles per hour, um, the fatality rate is about 85% for pedestrians that are hit at that speed. All to say, this gets us to our first guiding principle, which is we can't talk about pedestrian safety without talking about reducing vehicle speeds and volumes. Um, vehicle speeds are the reason when pedestrians are hit that they die. Um, and so that's one of the key reasons we're here. But I don't want to just talk about safety, and I don't want to just talk about things like reducing vehicle speeds, because there's this thing called choice that communities have. You get something by making these, these improvements in your streets and your community. People do want choices, and we're seeing all sorts of evidence from this through all different kinds of surveys. You know, this slide is not surprising to anyone, but you know, residents who are like, are, so residents are 65% more likely to walk in neighborhoods where there's sidewalks. People are gonna bike where there's bike lanes. If you start designing the streets in a way that supports these modes, um, you see people taking those modes. So I have worked in a lot of different communities, and I've yet to see a community where no one wants to bike ever and no one wants to walk ever. People want these walkable communities, and when given the choice, they take that opportunity. And that's, so I'm gonna talk about a few, different, a few different demographic groups. So younger adults are driving less and looking for other transportation options. This is really a phenomena that has existed for at least kind of, I guess, since the aughts. You know, 2005 is when I started seeing these. You were seeing a great reduction of teenagers getting driver's license. You were seeing young adults moving to cities at greater rates than they had been in previous decades. And part of that has to do with transportation options. Not everyone wants to sit in traffic all day. Not everyone wants to drive for all of their trips. Having that choice is influencing where people are choosing to live. And it's not just younger adults, it's older adults too. So in just four years, one in five Americans is gonna be over the age of 65. Um, among those who are non-drivers, they still wanna get out more often. They still want to have options. Um, so, and oh, on top of that, older adults are choosing to what we call age in place. So they're staying where they are um, and hoping that they, those options kind of emerge in some areas that perhaps don't necessarily have sidewalks or bike lanes or, or trails or any you know, transit options. So people do wanna live in those connected communities and we're seeing that from people both young um, and um, in the 65 plus crowd. All right, so another really big reason we're here is we're going to be talking, you'll probably hear us using the acronym ADA, uh, American with Disabilities Act. So we need to be designing streets for people who are differently abled. Um, and this can be a variety of mobility levels. This can be vision or hearing impairments. Um, there's a pretty wide range of what we're designing for. Um, so complete streets really have an attention to detail for the needs of differently abled uh, populations. Um, so one in five Americans are considered differently abled, and this comes from the U.S. Census. Um, and what I always like to point out when I say this is this is a moment in time. It's asking people, you know, one in five Americans when they fill out the survey are differently abled. Most people at some point in their lives are going to fall into this category, right? You know, you break a leg, you have some kind of injury, or you just get older, um, and your mobility needs change. So when we say we're designing streets for people who are differently abled, we're talking about really almost everyone, right? Because at some point, everyone is going to need um, streets that are designed for their mobility levels. All right, so one other thing I wanted to talk about with choice, um, because I think it's important to bring data to the table, is that there's a lot of data to support that if you provide these amenities that people use them. There was a really comprehensive study done by the Federal Highway Administration, and it looked at four different communities across the United States in different corners of the U.S. Um, and invested $25 million a year in infrastructure that supports non-motorized vehicle travel, uh, primarily pedestrian and bicycle infrastructure. And then they looked four years later to see how the modes had changes. You know, so they started. They were thinking like, okay, we we always talk about adding infrastructure and adding more choice, 
does it actually work? Um, they found that it did. Um, so there was a 22% increase in walking and a 49% increase in biking overall. Uh, when it came to utilitarian trips like commuting, running errands, et cetera, there was a 23% increase in trips made on foot. This, this sounds like um, not substantial, but we find it over and over and over again with different kinds of surveys and different results still producing the same outcome. Um, Older adults in particular are wanting you know, to stay in their community, as I mentioned, and they're wanting to live in this connected community. This issue of health is important. In fact, I almost thought about putting you know, public health as a big reason for complete streets, um, not just you know, for increasing physical activity and, and mental health, but also just we're coming out of a pandemic where having room to socially distance and to get out and enjoy your city on foot and by bike uh, became very important in a lot of different communities. So health plays a pretty big role in complete streets. Um, also, um, one thing, and this kind of has to do with kind of the economic development aspect. I mentioned that younger adults are looking to live in places where there's transportation choice, and that we're hearing from the business community that this is in fact true. A lot of communities that are a little bit, uh, that require cars to get to them, are really struggling in attracting younger populations to work uh, for those businesses. Um, I've talked to many developers who are suggesting that the, the business parks are struggling uh, to maintain occupancy there because of those sort of limited options. It's not everywhere, but you hear it a decent amount. Um, so. That's another reason, you know, quality of life issue. It's not just the neighborhoods you live, it's also the places that you work um, and visit for fun. All right, so guiding principle number three is design streets for the community you want. All right, so just kind of going over those, those guiding principles, uh, we can't talk about pedestrian safety without reducing vehicle speeds and volumes. I think this is a really important element. We're gonna be talking a lot about infrastructure and we're, that's what we're really working towards there. From a larger kind of larger view and zooming out a little bit, we're designing streets overall that promote choice, and we're designing streets for the communities you want. And that's why we're here, and that's why we're asking you and your opinions, because we want to find out what kind of community you want um, and continue to get feedback uh, throughout the day on this. All right, so I've been talking a lot, and I want to turn to you to kind of start talking about um, your vision for your community. If you look on the back of your agenda, there's three questions. Um, and these are really important. Um, I, I want to emphasize that I've been thoughtful about how we structured this workshop because we're going to be coming back to this visioning exercise and thinking a little bit about your responses all the way through the workshop. So the first question is, what are the biggest challenges related to Bronxville streets? This is something that's going to be really helpful for us to know as we're thinking of different context-sensitive solutions. Um, also, I want to think kind of long term. You know, it's, it's easy to think about, get into the details when we get to the mapping activity, but we need to be thinking long term into the future vision for Bronxville. 20 years down the road, what do you want the complete, what do you want the streets of Bronxville to look like? And then last, what are your indicators of success? If you're a data wonk, you might say it's X number of students, percent of the student body is walking to school. If you're not a data person, you might say, oh, you know, I, let a seven-year-old, and currently I only let my nine-year-old walk to school. You know, those sorts of indicators, whatever your indicator of success might be, um, we want to hear it uh, because we want to design a street that, that aims for that. So who needs a pen and who needs a clipboard? All right, I see a few people are still writing, but most people are wrapping up. So um, why don't we go ahead and kind of start to have a little bit of a discussion about what your thoughts are. Um, we are filming this and um, you know, we've got a couple mics, but I'll try to repeat uh, what you say back so that the, the people viewing can, can hear what you all have to say. Um, so we'll start with the first question. I, 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 we'll start with kind of the challenges. Uh, so what are the biggest challenges related to Bronxville streets today? All right, that was a really good comment. So, you know, comment pertaining to how do you match the, marry the unique history and uh, topography and uh, style that exists in today's streets with some of the safety improvements. All right, great comment. All right, who else? Ann? So, uh, comment about speed, uh, just to repeat the comment back for the viewers. Um, particularly the busy lives of people encourage uh, running, running to the train station, running really wherever. Yeah. Go ahead. 
Okay. Just to kind of repeat back, so challenges with sight lines, lack of sidewalks, um, and perhaps a higher speed limit than, than it needs to be for the community. Okay. Go ahead. They're also in a um, you know, very busy area. Right, so there's a lot of different uses, one of them being trucks. <laughs> and an increasing amount, and we're hearing this everywhere, increasing amount of deliveries throughout the day, particularly Amazon. And, right. Definitely. So comment just pertaining to winding streets, historic streets, narrow streets can create a lot of issues with uh, putting in sidewalks and, and other, you know, speed reducing infrastructure. So. No, I think it was just really good thing about pushing around. Right. Okay, that's a great comment. So there's a lot in there. So uh, first off, not just delivery vehicles, but also uh, vehicles that are maybe doing maintenance in, in the community um, are another kind of uh, user of these streets. And just the need to think about lots of different kinds of users of your streets. You know, it's not just the people who necessarily live here. It's also the people who maybe work here as well. Okay, great. Any others before we go on to the visioning? Alana? Sure. Um, I think also you mentioned like all Right. So there's a lot of different kinds of trips where there's different modes that are suitable for different kinds of trips. And we need to be thinking about potential options beyond single occupancy vehicles. Okay, great. Well, can I just make one observation sure. regarding this? Okay, yeah, so just a comment, uh, repeating that one. So New York State is actually controlling the speed limit in this community. Uh, for that to be changed, it needs to be approved at the state level. Currently, it's 30 miles per hour. To reduce it to something like 25 or 20 would take a lot. <laughs> take a lot, I guess. Okay. Yeah, here's about, like, you talked about. So a lot of discussion, just to kind of repeat it back for the viewers, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about the speed limit and then way to change it would require a change in the state laws um, and encouraging to, to call your, your legislator to, to potentially make that happen. Um, you know, posted speed limits, um, you know, they matter and we definitely want to design roadways that, that encourage going those speeds. I would say speed limit signs are not everything, right? So something we can think about throughout this workshop is how do we, if the street is 30 miles per hour, we need to at the very least be designing the street to seem like a 30 mile per hour street. Um, my concern is, you know, we're not gonna see this massive necessarily culture change if you, in driving, if you reduce it by five miles per hour, right? If the street doesn't change at all. So we'll be thinking a little bit about the infrastructure and kind of the infrastructure that might go into it that could encourage people to slow down their vehicles until the legislation can actually be changed. So just another way of thinking about it. Um, Let me add just one new thought. Right. I think that's a really good point. Um, so the point that was raised was considering the, the homeowners and, you know, their property and kind of matching, you know, the streets in front of their houses with, with what they've become accustomed to. Um, you know, so when you're thinking about different infrastructure improvements, we definitely need to be thinking about the context. I think it's really important to note and something I'm a big believer in is an engagement. Um, so maybe don't just go up and change things uh, for, uh, you know, a particular neighborhood. Uh, maybe engage them first. Um, we saw on our pre-visit there were a lot of kind of overgrown shrubbery. You know, there's an ask that can also take place there. It doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, you come and you change things immediately. Um, so engagement is a really big and important piece um, that, that we'll definitely need to be considering all along. Okay, so my other comment is very much related to that. So you're already, you know, people are just to kind of report back touching on this issue of trade-offs, which is if you're going to require sidewalks, you know, that takes up space and putting them in, you know, if they're not already there is, is a trade-off of that space, you know, and how it's used. So property owners are faced with this trade-off between using their yards versus using putting in a sidewalk or, you know, and then maintaining that sidewalk would fall upon their responsibility most likely. I don't know if the exact rules in this, in this community, but that's the most common that I'm familiar with. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and transition a little bit to the longer term. Okay, one more, and then we'll transition to the longer term. Right. That's a good point. So just to kind of repeat it back is, um, you know, this is a walking community um, inherently, right, and historically speaking. Uh, but the bus policy, not having a bus um, with the schools, requires people to choose to either drive or walk. And it's probably in our best interest to encourage walking as much as possible, given the situation at the pickup drop-off areas around the school. So. Yeah, you can't imagine, you really can't realistically that overall. Right. 
Yeah, and I would agree with that. And I, we'll do kind of a virtual walkthrough of, of the quarter that we're looking at, and you can kind of see the variation and get at what you're speaking to, which is to what extent are the property owners kind of maintaining the sidewalks in their space that uphold that sort of um, invisible handshake agreement or contract that, that we have to, uh, to maintain and give that, make this a community of choice for, for walking, uh, walking to school. Okay, so let's move on to, um, to the, the longer term vision. So there's been a lot of talk about kind of the history of Bronxville and how it's developed and how you know, property owners are accustomed to things being a certain way. I'm curious how you maybe think that might change um, and how the street design might change in 20 years um, if your kind of vision aligns correctly. Let's, anyone have any thoughts? Okay, so fantastic comment. I think the key word here is accessible. Uh, so a lot of comments about downtown, perhaps other areas as well. Having that choice to, instead of being forced to drive, um, to, when you wanna to go to a restaurant or the grocery store or run errands downtown, you have this option to potentially walk there and seeing an increased amount of walking. Okay, great. Uh, anyone else? Go ahead. Um, well, something I, I was thinking about or realized that's more valuable Right, so uh, just to comment on pandemic um, and how that's changed, how we think about social engagement um, and interactions, those serendipitous interactions that you might take, have in the street that when you're walking or biking are perhaps a little bit more common. And there's a lot of evidence that I mentioned in the quality of life slides that support that. Um, so it's a really good, really good point. Right, so just seeing that vision uh, for downtown particularly, but other areas perhaps seeing that sort of engagement increase. Naomi? I agree with what said. I guess I would just bring it in place for a long time. Right. Uh, good point about the timeline here is that uh, 20 years seems a long time. Um, we'll be talking later about implementation and how there's certain things that might be able to be implemented sooner and there's certain strategies for that. Mm -hmm. We don't have to wait for a street to get paved or repaved or whenever, you know, a roadway reconstruction project to make some of these things happen. Um, so, go ahead. Right, um, so just a comment on the incredible asset that Westchester County has and thanks to the county for, for a lot of their planning through the years and you might wanna comment too, um, of developing this incredible trail system. Although there are certain misconnections and you know that are linking missing like links to that trail that could maybe be improved upon. So maybe in the 20-year vision, seeing seeing the trails run and through the town or through uh, different areas. Yeah, did you have a comment? Yeah, I just was going to say you know we also. Okay, so a few comments here. A business owner who sees a lot of customers walking and biking, you know, even during a snowstorm has customers and opens the business for that. Would like to see increased bike racks, and then a comment on the outdoor dining that has grown as a result of the pandemic. Hoping to see that stay. Any other thoughts for kind of long-term vision? All right, Steve. And connecting to this idea of continuity. Right. So it's kind of like sidewalks were needed, where sidewalks can't be put in. You know, design the street so the traffic volumes are slow enough, or uh, traffic speeds are slow enough that it feels comfortable. Right, great. So moving on to kind of like indicators of success. So these are a lot of really good ideas related to safety, access, quality of life, economic development that you've mentioned. What would, let's say you're walking along in 20 years and you see something or you become aware of something or you hear something that would indicate that you've sort of arrived at that vision. What, what would be some of those indicators? Right, so appreciating seeing the car line not going, backing up uh, down Midland, right? And uh, significantly, back. significantly yes, backing up. Yeah. So a comment about just uh, the pickup lines potentially being shortened and, and some of the comments from the pre-visit that really stuck out to at least the consultant team was, was A, a lot of things have been tried and this, uh, what's been going on now seems to be the best option of those. Uh, the other one that really stands out in my mind is that during walk to school day or week, um, the car line, it, that is an effective event and the car line is, is greatly reduced if not diminished um, to a, a really reasonable level, which 
I honestly, this it's incredible to hear that because so rarely do I hear that a community has such a strong base of, of walking that you know that really turns the turns the dial a little bit. Do you have a comment? Yeah. No, I, well, I hope to not be more specific. Yeah, that's a fantastic comment just about education, um, particularly at the school level, um, in street safety among other elements. Um, you know, I when I was walking to the train after the pre-visit, that was right when everyone was going out to get lunch from the school. And there were, I mean, the sidewalks were crowded. You know, it was, there was a lot of people. So you could see why some people were kind of spilling out into the street. And some of those more crowded times are some of the things that we need to be thinking about and accommodating for when considering street design, particularly in the downtown area. Um, so yeah, thanks for the comment. Okay, any others, Naomi? Right, so uh, people are being comfortable using their cars. I mean, that really gets at the choice, right? And I used to live in Portland, Oregon, and, and people, the question that people always ask is, how did you get here? Like, what mode did you take to get here? Because you have all of these choices. And so, you know, thinking about, like, maybe that's a question that you ask each other in 20 years. <laughs> how did you get here? Not what route you took, but which mode, you know? Um, okay, great. Just one on the related to that, yeah. um, anyway, okay. related to that, um, so thinking about the downtown and, and getting cars maybe on the periphery so the downtown can be even more walkable than it already is, in other words. I've got some ideas for you, but I'll follow up with you <laughs> later. Okay. We'll take a couple more, and then we'll move on. Go ahead. Um, so just a couple more related um, together. Having those options. So thinking about different modes like scooters, um, perhaps e-bikes. I, I know there's a topography situation in this town with the hills. So having some like e-assist bikes, things like that, and starting to see those would be an indicator of success. Cool. Um, yeah. Two more. Okay. I'd like to see families who can bike together. Right. That's a great one. So uh, she was mentioning the indicator of success was seeing families biking together. Um, and just going to give you some hope that, to me, was my personal indicator of success for my neighborhood that I've lived in for seven years. Um, during the pandemic was the first time that I saw the bikes that you were talking about, and they've grown in great numbers. So it is possible. It took a long time to really achieve that through a lot of protected bike infrastructure. I'm in Brooklyn, so it was kind of required to be protected in a lot of ways. Um, and I think that's a fantastic one, so noted. All right, uh, one more if anyone has any, and if not, we'll move on. All right, nope, okay. All right, well, these were fantastic and very helpful for our team to kind of think about when we're thinking about different design uh, options. But moving on from visioning, um, I want to talk very briefly about safe routes to school because it's very relevant for this particular study area that we're about to launch into. So, well, okay, so backing up, safe routes to school kind of initiated as sort of this grassroots effort in California. Um, and it worked its way up through the system and became a federal program that actually had some funding. Um, since then, it's been largely led by a lot of states and, um, and individual municipalities. Um, and the reason for it was a lot of the stuff that you've already really been mentioning. It's about quality of life. It's about having the option to bike. Um, I think probably the very, very beginning of it was that they just had a really long pick up and drop off line at this particular school. Um, and it was a frustration for everyone and it felt unsafe for a lot of the, the parents. So they wanted to, they were in kind of a walkable community already. They thought, hey, why don't, we, why don't we have this encouraging program to get people to walk a little bit more? And it just grew from there. And there's truly hundreds of schools across the country that participate in this program, and this one may have participated at least on some level in, in, in one of them at some point. But, but here's kind of the context at where we're at. So when we think about commuting times, um, you know, and how busy they are, we always talk about the commute. We always talk about how busy the commute during peak hours is. Commute only makes up like 30, 40 percent of, of the travel that takes place during the day. We think of it as this the behemoth that everyone is commuting all the time. Car trips during morning rush hour are 14, up to 14% of cars that are on the road at that time. It's a huge number of people. Um, and you see that with the, with the backups that take place on Midland, right? Like you see these long traffic lines because people are you know, driving their kids to school. And if you can imagine if Bronxville were, Bronxville were less pedestrian friendly, how long that line would be. Because if you're walking around at 7.45 to 8 a.m. in the morning, you're seeing a lot of people who are, who are walking. Not every community has that, and the pickup lines can be absolutely insane in those areas. So that's kind of where it came from. 
when it kind of reached the federal level, there was a strong interest in also addressing uh, kind of the children and teen obesity epidemic in the country. And so there were a lot of like public health reasons that, that this continued to gain support in, a, in particularly a lot of different areas was we can't necessarily, there's a lot of contrib contributing factors to the obesity epidemic, but we don't have control over a lot of them, but giving people the option to incorporate physical activity in their daily life um, is a big one. Um, so it's um, one of the many reasons that a lot of schools started it. Um, and it's, this idea of like walking or biking to school has been around, as shown by this historic card, um, for a long time. Um, Originally, it kind of talked about five E's. The number of E's and what they stand for has changed over time, but, but generally, these were kind of the five original E's, which were education, enforcement, evaluation, encouragement, and engineering. And um, we've already heard about uh, education being a big one. So safety curriculum, safe routes presentations, such as this one, uh, there's some bicycle rodeos, which is just a fancy term for like a bicycle safety course for kids set up in a parking lot perhaps where there's no cars allowed and kind of doing some sort of obstacle course and some training, sometimes they give away free helmets, that sort of thing. So lots of education, as you were mentioning, um, you know, often school-based where it's kind of like the PE classes incorporate bicycle safety and walking safety um, as, as, part of the, as part of the curriculum. Um, enforcement is one that um, has gone in and out of being included, but definitely enforcement near schools. For those who were on the pre-visit, we saw uh, public safety was was at work, um, and uh, you know, you know, there were crossing guards, there was you know, speed uh, trying speed reduction efforts that were going play, going on there. Evaluation is a big one. Um, it's not one that most of you are probably super concerned with, but as an urban planner, I'm extremely concerned with <laughs> because understanding how these programs actually change things, like if they're actually effective. So checking year after year and seeing the number of kids walking or biking to school school can be a really important part of the program. Encouragement, I would say, is just like, is a really, really, really big part of this. You know, it's, it's programming. It's not just about um, all of these that we've just mentioned. So walking school bus and uh, bike trains, those have been really effective in a number of communities I've worked in. Um, so. I think what we what I heard on the pre-visit was that about I was seeing a lot of eight and nine year olds and that seemed to kind of nine, ten year olds kind of plus that age group, they were the ones kind of walking to school and that's the level where you start seeing people walking to school by themselves. For you know, parents who might not be able not feel comfortable with that, starting a little bit younger, um, but maybe having a parent volunteer lead a bike train or lead a walking school bus, which is just a group of kids. You can get people as young as you know six, you know, <laughs> walking to school. So that's like a whole new group of people who would maybe be driving in individual cars that could now have that opportunity to walk or bike to school. Um, I have seen this done very effectively, and I have some resources for starting one if anyone is interested in knowing more. Um, and then last is engineering, which I think they call it engineering because it's just an E. It, it's infrastructure, <laughs> and so that's a big reason why we're here today is, is thinking about you know infrastructure, and that's what we're about to get into. So, does anyone have any questions about these programs? This program and how it might work? Okay. They may, yeah, they may. So, I'm not exactly sure, but just to kind of catch viewers up, there's been a discussion about uh, evaluation piece and potentially doing surveys. Um, uh, Bronxville, what is it, Bronxville Safe Streets, is that what it's called? Okay, has already done a survey where they're seeing 70% of respondents um, do walk every day. Um, but continuing the idea of, of having some evaluation ongoing to understand uh, how you can indicate if there's been a successful program or not is, is really invaluable to the village and others. Yeah? One other point. Yeah, we're really generating a lot of encouragement. All right. Really great idea um, and, and something other communities have done. And I'll actually have some slides on that later in the presentation. But just for our viewers, there's been a lot of discussions about uh, Safe, walk to, Safe uh, walk to School Week, uh, which is a really successful program in part by the help of um, five public safety officers who assist with the, the pedestrian volume. So something to keep in mind, it's very successful, successful because of a lot of different stakeholders in the communities make it, make it possible. So um, we're getting to the point, so we're gonna transition to, to infrastructure. Um, so we're gonna transition to stuff that's a little bit more detailed. Parker's gonna go through some slides because I'm sure you're sick of hearing my voice. Um, so Parker's gonna take over, uh, talk about these. A lot of everyone here, we were like all on the, the tour last week together. That was great. Um, so basically, since that time, me and Michael went back, 
um, kind of did some brainstorming to just think of anything that might be applicable to the route that we saw. Um, so we kind of come up, came up with a non-exhaustive list of elements that could slow traffic, could improve pedestrian safety, that sort of thing, um, based on the conversation that we had. Um, there are certainly things that could apply to like larger streets, to different modes, bicycling that we didn't hear too much about. Um, so just keep that in mind that you know, those aren't elements that we necessarily included um, in the presentation. Uh, the other thing is, um, you know, as we go through, just keep an open mind um, of the type of things that we have in this list. Um, before we get into you know where that might be applicable maybe maybe it might be in somewhere maybe it might not um, just trying to provide ideas um, so then when we can go to the, the mapping exercise I think that'll be the appropriate time to have uh, sort of that conversation but certainly if you have any questions about how anything might work so for example we might talk about speed bumps uh, where those have been applied or might not um, we can certainly take those questions um, so as I mentioned, Michael and I, we, we really heard the conversation last week really focus around two themes, um, really pedestrian facilities and safety in general, um, and just traffic speed and volume uh, on some of these side streets. Um, so with that in mind, uh, pedestrian facilities, we really talk about um, sidewalks and crossings and different things that we can do um, with each of those components. And um, with speed control, uh, we'll go through some different elements, uh, vertical elements such as like speed bumps, uh, but maybe some other things that uh, people in this town, you might not just be familiar with it because it doesn't exist here yet, uh, but things that certainly might exist in uh, very similar communities, um, as well as potentially some volume uh, reduction uh, strategies that we can discuss um, in uh, the mapping exercise. Uh, so the first, we saw this picture, uh, we certainly talked a lot about sidewalks. Um, and I just really want, we all know sidewalks, uh, essentially a four to five foot pathway on the side. Um, one key point that we want to mention, and Michael talked about this, is we want to make sure uh, we uh, design and build sidewalks for everybody, regardless of who pays for them. Um, not only uh, handicapped individuals, but uh, people with strollers, children on bikes. Um, there's a lot of reasons to have accessible sidewalks. Um, and there's, there's pretty strict guidelines to make that happen. Um, so, you know, if we have a place with steep grade, we have some technical, um, uh, technical guides there. Uh, but basically, if we have a steep street, we can we cannot have a sidewalk go steeper uh, than the existing street. So we have some hills in in Bronxville um, that could be applicable to where you might want to put sidewalks and where where you uh, how you might want to plan for that. For new for, for new sidewalks, right? Yeah, this is uh, this is required if it's in the public right of way, regardless of who pays for it. Yeah. Um, at the end of the day, the town owns the public right of way, so they would be responsible for uh, meeting uh, ADA accessibility requirements. So yeah. This was an example when we purchased this house in 1999. You know, that was our, right. our time. So certainly, questions I think will for discussion as we can help frame in in this in our report as well um, policies and how to pay and 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 that sort of thing. Um, you know, I think. I think the discussion that we had last week is, you know, some of these areas might take some inf uh, considerable infrastructure and money to get these sidewalks built. You know, at that point in time, that's when you would really have to meet that accessibility requirement. Yeah. It's not to say that, you know, we'd have to go and upgrade, we'd require property owners to upgrade yeah. sidewalks that are existing. Yeah. So it's just something to keep in mind, certainly an item in our toolbox, um, you know, when, when we start thinking about sidewalks, definitely anything new. We definitely want to make sure, is this accessible, um, and uh, how to plan for that. Is there a requirement for a setback from the road itself? Uh, not necessarily. Just from a comfort point of view, you might so want to... Four feet, be snow, road like road. snow storage, etc. cetera. Um, usually you want signage. Um, usually you want two feet at least, but if you need to, you can come up to that, that curb. Um, Roadway crossings, 
Um, we, we've seen some of these uh, we call high visibility crosswalks or continental style crosswalks. Um, these have really been shown to provide the best visibility uh, for crosswalks, especially at night compared to like on the top here, you see like the standard crossing with just the two lines. Um, so those, those continental crossings uh, do a really good job in increasing uh, sidewalk visibility. Um, and we have a whole bunch of them around the school, so that's a good thing, but it's not necessarily standard around the village. Um, the other thing I just point out, because a lot of people like these uh, pavers, brick sidewalk, or sorry, brick crosswalks, um, or anything like that stamp pavement that is colored um, with the standard uh, lines. Well, legal I just you know people like them because they're, they're texture but they're not very visible at night so there's actually a picture on the right it's very hard to see but <laughs> it was it looks better on my screen I guess um, but you'll see that that's a stamped like a red stamp pavement and it's almost impossible to tell the difference between the red stamp pavement and the dark pavement at night um, so while pedestrians might like them because it looks nice uh, just from a visibility and practicality thing it might be something to consider um, when proposing that type of uh, treatment. So this is red and um, so sometimes I've seen towns if they want to do a stamp pavement they still do the continental white so you can see that and then some sort of uh, texture underneath. Um, but it's just an important comment on uh, just the visibility of crosswalks. We have moved away from the red brick. So if you're interested like the city like Stamford Connecticut they've done these but then they'll just mark the standard crossings on top and they've liked that as kind of like a, as a compromise yeah uh, another thing we're kind of going from uh, low cost to easy implement to higher um, advanced mid block if you have a mid block crosswalk uh, you can uh, install advanced markings so in this case you would have yield lines 20 to 50 feet prior uh, just to encourage, ra again, raising the visibility of crosswalks um, and uh, encouraging motorists to stop a little bit short of the crosswalk than they might otherwise. Um, particularly when you have like a multi-lane road, which you don't have too many in Bronxville, uh, it just improves pedestrian visibility. Yeah. But we do have 20 through 22. Yeah. So maybe, you know, this might not be something that we need on like all streets, but if you have like a a highly utilized crosswalk or um, a crosswalk that we're proposing on Route 22, that might be something that we want to consider proposing. So I have, I have several more items in the toolbox, and then I think that when we start, because yeah. th th there are specific issues with Masterton and Midland that I think we want to talk about. Um, but we, yeah, we certainly have more, like from signage, more to more intensive measures that we can take. Um, you know, certainly at high visibility crosswalk signage, uh, this could be yellow or fluorescent. Um, I know I've heard a little bit, you know, this is one of those things you talk about character of the town versus um, uh, the signage. Uh, something that we can certainly take a look at and usually you have a, a advanced warning sign and then a sign at the crosswalk itself. And again, maybe something that um, you take a look at on those more highly uh, trafficked routes. And it's kind of related to um, what we're talking about, the rec uh, rectangular rapid flashing beacon or an RRFB. Uh, so this picture is actually at the Masterton and Pond Field. Uh, so someone had pushed the button and you see that it, this is lit up. And then in addition to this, you have the LEDs on the sign itself flashing. Um, so a great way to um, have visibility and we can talk about, again, we can talk about the specific inter intersection, some of the challenges that we can uh, think of ideas for. Um, I just want to note that on New York State roads, uh, there is requirements to be met, uh, volume requirements, um, but the biggest requirement in that list is really the pedestrian, like the pedestrian crossing volume. Um, and we can talk about that um, in the next slides. Um, some more intensive crosswalk treatments. Uh, raised crosswalks uh, have been frequently employed in uh, many communities. Um, it's essentially a speed bump with a flat, flat top that you can uh, serves as the crosswalk. 
Um, really slows vehicles down. I mean, you have no choice but to slow down at the, at the crosswalk itself. Uh, so usually it's curb height. So you make the, so it would be six to eight inches. So that would be a level. So you would have no curb ramp down to the street anymore. Um, and you'd have a level crossing and then the vehicles would come up to that point. So really, the speed table, speed hump, they'd be really similar uh, design to that. So it's not like one of the tiny bumps, it would be uh, a flat top. Has that been considered at the Masterton? Uh, so usually these are mid-block. Um, if, if at an intersection, you can do a raised intersection entirely, but some, an intersection the size of Pond, Field, and Midland are, is pretty big. Usually you see those on like some of the small neighborhood streets, they are raised raise them and make the whole thing kind of like a, a speed hump. <laughs> right, and that would be similar to like how we, how we treat driveways a lot of times. A lot of times the, drive, the sidewalk is at, you know, driveway is at sidewalk level. Um, I didn't see that's too much in this community, but in many communities the sidewalks are maintained level and the driveway comes up to that sidewalk level. So it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of a bump and that's kind of what you're referring to. You know, uh, also employed a lot of heavy like mid-block crossings or uh, pedestrian refuge islands. Um, so there's a built example in Connecticut as well as like a little model of how that might work. Um, essentially, really you're only asking pedestrians to cross one lane at a time and the goal would be to build uh, an island probably like eight feet in width, big enough where it's comfortable to, to, to take a break to watch traffic from the other direction. Um, so that's really successful on busier roads because instead of trying to cross left and right, you only look in one direction. Once you get a break, you go and then proceed uh, once the opposing direction has a break in traffic. We'll move to speed and volume reduction. Um, so essentially you break this into vertical elements, horizontal elements, and kind of like uh, other cross-sectional changes that we can do. Um, we're all familiar with speed humps. Uh, very effective in uh, reducing speeds you know, at the location of speed humps themselves. So usually you have to like, do them every 500 feet or so to make sure that you don't get uh, speeding elsewhere on the street. Um, maybe limited on areas with emergency access routes, bus routes, areas with high, like truck traffic, higher volume streets. Um, usually you see these employed right on like lower residential streets. Um, it also might be limited on areas with slope and curvature, uh, which I know we have many areas in the, in the village um, which have slopes. I think what you haven't described is the signage that's needed. Right. right. Certainly you have, right, so then you talk about placement and where you might want to have it with, with residents could be a challenge, right? right. You have uh, the sign there several hundred feet back, you have a warning sign. Uh, as well as markings and then parking uh, would be prohibited like yeah. at the speed bump itself. So certainly some um, signage is an, uh, challenges. Certainly some challenges right. with all of these. The village just passed Just for the microphone, um, you said that the, the village has passed a speed bump policy um, that can be referenced. Yeah, off the website. Great, thank you. Um, horizontal elements that we can include for speed reduction, uh, we call this a chicane or horizontal deflection. Uh, this is actually uh, one that's built right next to my house um, in kind of like a, one of the grids. Uh, they two lane chicane through here. Um, one of the issues with the design on the left can be people just drive down the middle uh, because there's nothing but the center line uh, preventing you from driving the middle. Uh, so the example on the right is a model of how you might design this differently with like employing a uh, median island or something to force that uh, movement, that lateral shift, uh, so you can't drive down the middle of the center line. Uh, probably getting into elements that are a little bit um, different for people in the in the room this is also actually right next to my house this is a yield controlled choker um, so essentially what this is is you're taking a, a two-lane road and you're building some sort of landscape element to only allow one direct like one lane of travel um, so i put this at the bottom here 
Uh, really, this is similar operation to a vehicle parked in a street. So, you know, say before they built this, you could have a vehicle parked here. You kind of have to yield to oncoming traffic to navigate around the vehicle. Uh, the idea is to permanently have that feature in the street uh, to require yielding. Um, so on this street in particular, these are placed like alternating on alternating sides to kind of have a chicane movement and to, to really slow traffic. Um, this one is built on one side of the, the street. Sometimes these are built in the center of the road to kind of really create a defined gateway uh, to a neighborhood street. And Parker, you would be expecting these on very low volume roads? Right, so yeah, so the, because it's a yield movement, uh, you know, you don't, we don't want to be putting these on like main roads, but certainly neighborhood streets, these are appropriate. Um, anywhere where yielding might be appropriate. Um, because of because it's similar operation to a vehicle parked on the street, you could think of like this would be appropriate on any residential street where parking could be allowed, where you'd have to like yield to oncoming traffic, and that happens all the time in, in neighborhoods. Uh, at intersections, uh, we could do a bump out curb extension. So this has already been employed at Masterton and Midland. Um, so the red line is showing where the previous pavement was and the green line shows where the current uh, path of travel to make that right turn. And you can really see that it really, uh, um, this design uh, really makes it, uh, forces motorists to make a sharper turn to slow down uh, where previously they could kind of just dart up the, uh, the hill. Um, not only that, it reduces the crossing width distance. So, you know, if that crosswalk was there previously, uh, it would have been maybe 20 to 30 feet longer than it is today because of the, the, the curb extension. And coming down the hill, they were allowed to go straight. Um, a lot of times you see this, if you had like a, a four-way intersection with, uh, like say in downtown with parking, they're very effective with parking. Uh, because you have the space to make, you know, where there's no parking allowed next to an intersection, you can put curbs there uh, and to so, slow the traffic. So some other elements that we have, um, center line removal. Uh, so I just note uh, the feds require that center lines be installed um, on any roadway with over, over 6,000 vehicles per day. So just for context, that's that Route 22 is about 9,000 vehicles per day, and that's a very busy road. Um, so on a lot of neighborhood streets, you have much, much less volume. Um, and the idea behind that is uh, anything that's like the center line, any edge lines, they can communicate that those streets are more of like highway infrastructure. Um, so here's an example. The picture on the bottom uh, is one of the side streets. I think that's Oriole. Yes. that we, we saw. And I just want to compare it to uh, Elm Rock and just the sense, the, the communication that even the, the yellow center line uh, gives. Um, a lot of times, you know, we want to have uh, some markings around curvature. A lot of times you can put these around curvature and then on sh like straightaway sections, I'll remove the center line. Um, the center line stripings have been found to be associated with higher uh, traffic speeds. Um, it's, the research I found wasn't too conclusive, uh, but certainly points to that direction. Uh, the other thing you can do, uh, narrow roadways. Uh, so a two-way street can really be as narrow as 18 feet. Um, allowing yield control parking uh, to get around uh, parked vehicles. Um, so some streets are wider than others in the study area. Uh, we have narrower streets, we have some wider streets. Um, one thing that I just put out here as an example uh, to narrow streets with materials to allow parking uh, could be an option. So this case is in Hartford, this is a one-way street. Uh, but just shows how they use cobblestones to narrow the, the travel lane while providing parking. And I think they do this pretty effectively to reduce the, the perception. Yeah. Where do you get the 18 foot road? So that's just the minimum width that you can have a roadway. That's just, that's a standard. Accepted standard. Right, right. Yeah, usually, yeah. That's like, that's pretty narrow. So usually we have 
like a, on a highway, the uh, travel lane would be like 12 feet. So that 12 plus 12 would be 24. Right, right. Um, but anywhere on that range is accepted. But certainly 18 feet is very, <laughs> is on the narrower side. And I think you can also do this just with a white line. So, the certainly, I think Michael Amobil can talk about, there's kind of like a, a, a variety of different ways we can implement these to test them out, to, from testing them out to like hard construction to get kind of the materials that we would want long term. And we, we did just test it, not we just, uh, uh, certainly signage. Uh, this is another ta uh, picture of master tin. Um, we've seen some of these LED feedback signs. Uh, you know, we can talk about the effectiveness, I think, in the group uh, table, but um, certainly we see these employed uh, around town. Uh, we talk, uh, remember we want to talk speed and volume. When we're talking risk to pedestrian, speed and volume is really the, the things that we want to think about. Um, so this is ideas for volume reduction. Uh, here's a picture, an example. Um, you see one way down the hill, and really what's that, what's that doing? You can't go up the hill, it really reduces the crossing width there, um, and reduces the volume that that pedestrian is exposed to at that, at that location, as well as up in that neighborhood. Um, you know, so something that we can explore, I don't wanna get too caught up right now in where that might be applicable, uh, but something like this could reduce uh, cut-through traffic if properly implemented. Um, it could create additional space on the roadway. So I like this picture because you see now that they have a bike lane. So if a bike lane is important to this community. Where they're, but obviously this comes up with some trade-offs that can be fairly significant. Include not the least of which is uh, access changes and challenges for area residents and or businesses based on where it might be. Um, so very important uh, consideration when uh, implementing one of these, as well as any volume uh, diverted to any other adjacent route. So um, just an idea uh, that we can, we can talk about. Another thing we can do um, at intersections themselves, uh, we can restrict certain movements. So um, a lot of times on like, you know, major roads, you see right in, right out. So this example, when you approach this intersection, you can only turn right. Uh, to eliminate cut through traffic. Um, Michael will show you examples later in this presentation where uh, you know you put a median island in the middle to prevent through traffic. There's different things that we can do uh, short of making that, that segment actually one uh, way. And finally, uh, whenever we're talking about cut through traffic uh, and volume on any side streets, uh, it's important to acknowledge, you know, what's the, the root cause of why are people cutting through? Is there some sort of issue on any arterial? So we talk about pond field. Um, you know, we just want to take a quick look and think about, is there any reason that pond field or the main, main road uh, might be uh, congested or have uh, backups that people are avoiding? Um, so this is just Google Maps, it's, it's just showing the traffic. So I'm just showing you that this is like Friday afternoon that there's, there's moderate traffic on Pond Field. Um, I don't know the cause for that, we haven't looked into that, but you know, maybe there's some sort of easy signal issue, I don't know. But um, it's, it's something to think about when you're talking about cut through traffic. Let's think about what people are avoiding. So I wanna keep going just so we can get to the discussion. Uh, Michael is gonna have some photos of the corridor. All right. Thanks, Parker. Stuck with me again. All right. So we're going to do a virtual walkthrough of the corridor. Almost all of you are very familiar with this corridor, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time here because I want to really get you at this table, which is sort of the main event here. But just as a refresher, this was the corridor that we were focused on. We also went down uh, Route 22 to Pondfield and back, but this is the primary corridor we're looking at. It has a variety of what we call street typologies from very localized neighborhood streets all the way to a state road. Um, so. You know, we began kind of last week in, in our pre-visit just taking a look. And again, uh, we welcome you to join us um, at 11.30 to, to do another walk of the corridor if you're available. But uh, most of you also participated in, in this pre-visit um, with this focus here on, on Masterton Midland, which has gotten a lot of attention. Of course, this incredible improvement. Oftentimes when we go into a community, uh, when we talk about kind of realigning and squaring up and teeing up an intersection like you've already done, it seems very ambitious. So I'm pleasantly surprised to see that this has already been taken care of uh, before we get out here, because this is what it used to look like. 
Um, so you can really see how if you're a driver, this is obviously from a driver perspective, Google Street View, how you would kind of just zoom up Masterton there. You now have to kind of make that sharper turn, um, so slowing down vehicle speeds, which it sounds like it's been effective. Um, Masterton, there's a variety of sidewalk conditions, um, many of which are you know very attractive, but perhaps not ADA compliant, right? You know, um, so that's you know going to be a real challenge. Of course, there is a steeper grade at this location, um, but you know uh, the one on the right is kind of a, a, a gravel situation. We've got stonework on the left. Um, stonework kind of continues, you know, throughout this this curve, and this is a key challenge area and one we want to focus on. Um, when we talk about our, uh, when we get to the mapping activity. Uh, Beechwood is kind of a whole different typology, right? I don't know if anyone remembers who was on the walking tour, but when you make that turn on Beechwood, what do we do? We all kind of spread, we were spreading out. Like just naturally we were entering a different area and felt comfortable taking up basically the entire roadway, as you see as we were kind of going up toward, I think, Orchard. Um, so, you know, this is a different street typology. We commented on the tour that maybe sidewalks aren't necessary. Um, and I will point out that complete streets don't have to mean sidewalks. They don't have to mean bike lanes. It's, it's, it's sensitive to the actual street. It's a context sensitive design. Um, so Oriel Avenue, which we've already shown, but notice it straightens out in the wide way, the, the roadway widens a little bit. Um, so something to, to be mindful of is we've got space to work with here as opposed to here. This is a really constrained right of way. Okay, and then Elm Rock Road, uh, Parker already showed this image. You've got the double line. Um, it's, a, it's a little bit wider than this image might really show. You can see that those cars are actually parked. They're not, they're not traveling. So people are used to parking on this street and using that space in a sort of flexible manner. And then this is the image. At, uh, so left is Elm Rock Road on the left. And then this is Route 22. Uh, Right there, you can see uh, Dusenberry Road is just the north, uh, which I've heard from many of the participants is a, is a cut through option if you're on foot or on bike, but not necessarily for cars. There's uh, no outlet there. And here's another image, so that's Dusenberry right there. This is our other area of really concern and focus that we're going to be talking about is getting people, particularly kids and students, from the east side of Route 22 to the west side, so they could potentially make that uh, safe route to school happen. Um, so key challenges and opportunities, these are just a short list of what we've thought of. So topography, winding streets, um, overgrown shrubbery we saw, missing stop bars and crosswalks, inconsistent sidewalks, ADA accessibility, opportunities. Um, most of these streets are relatively low traffic, low stress streets, which from a um, federal and state guidance perspective is a real asset for the things that you can kind of you can implement on these streets. There's also existing demand uh, just judged by the opinions and thoughts of the people in the room and the participation here. Clearly there's a strong demand for for walking and biking uh, or at least walking. Um, interest in safe routes to school as you've mentioned. Uh, the right-of-way is actually quite a bit wider um, than the street is currently designed. We did look at the parcel map parcel data and the parcel maps, um, and on many of these streets, notably Masterton, uh, the village owns um, additional space that's, that's not just the street. Um, so even though the street itself looks very, very uh, narrow, there's an additional few feet on either side of the street to work with. And then last, uh, you know, it's an aesthetically beautiful area uh, that's, you know, largely very pleasant to walk through. Um, all right, so I want to get into the small group discussion because I want us to have half an hour to really start putting pen on paper. So if I'm going to start the timer, um, but if uh, you could join at the tables up front. All right, so with that, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, so come on up, and in 30 minutes, we'll kind of report back. So right now you're seeing members of the uh, workshop, the village administrators, uh, members of uh, local community groups uh, participating in a group exercise to uh, add their comments to maps and add their ideas of how to improve uh, walking to along Masterton, along Elm Rock Road, uh, between Route 22 and the Bronxville School. I wanted to leave some time to start thinking about big ideas because um, this is, you know, the whole purpose of this workshop is, is brainstorming, right? Like we want to we hear what you have to say and some big ambitious plans. Um, 
I know at my group and potentially others, we talked about uh, Masterton and that particular intersection at Midland quite a bit. Um, so let me talk through kind of some of the big ideas we came up on the pre-visit. Uh, we'll have a chance, I'm gonna go through the, the first two ideas and then we can have a conversation about um, what your groups talked about at this particular intersection. So the first big idea that came up at least um, on the pre-visit was thinking about doing a one-way master tin. So here's an image of uh, just an example of what that could look like um, by having a one-way that frees up space for bike infrastructure, for sidewalk. Um, there's a lot of potential for that. Other communities have done this before. Um, something else I wanna mention is you can do something called a pilot project. So you can test something out, which I know the, the village has done effectively on a number of other projects before. Um, so you know we talked about in my group at least, um, potentially you know, on the walk to school week or other instances where you could do some sort of temporary fixture to see you know, how does the traffic flow change? Is there community benefit to opening up more space on Masterton uh, to allow for pedestrians or strollers to use uh, this particular roadway to access the school? You could do it during certain hours. Um, we have something similar in the neighborhood that I live in uh, where from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Uh, the roadway has some traffic barriers where you can still drive around them, but it greatly reduces the traffic speeds um, and, and really kind of is a temporary solution that's kind of temporal too, like late at night where you volunteers actually remove the traffic barriers in that location. Um, so that's big idea number one. Big idea number, idea number two, which came up on the pre-visit, but um, I've heard kind of in piecemeal, is this concept of a neighborhood greenway uh, where you're going, so 20 miles per hour or less. This is the, this is the guidance from Portland, Oregon, um, where they do 20 miles per hour or less, upper limit of 2,000 cars per day, ideally less than 1,000 cars per day, which something like Masterton would, would fit kind of that description. No cut through streets for cars, generally aiming for low level of stress, um, but what this really does is it concentrates your resources, your infrastructure, your maintenance onto a specific corridor, which someone was mentioning before we did the breakout groups. Um, so this, this area, you really do a lot of traffic calming on these streets, you do wayfinding, you do a lot of elements that indicates to drivers, pedestrians, and cyclists that this street is for all users. Um, you pro these corridors in Portland, at least, are prioritized per for repaving, uh, for consideration for people with strollers um, and uh, cyclists as well. But there's a large element of traffic calming. Um, I won't go into any detail on this, but I'm happy to talk to you about some of the things that they do. But they do a lot of traffic diversion, such as like center lane medians where cyclists can go through, but cars turning from busier streets wouldn't necessarily be able to make that left turn onto the neighborhood greenway. Um, but again, signage plays a big role and just honestly so much of it is, is marketing. Like coming upon an agreement on a corridor that is going to be a pedestrian and bicycle focused corridor um, can really go a long way. So I'll start with those two big ideas and see if there's any reactions, um, acknowledging that we're running low on time, but I do want to hear your input on that. In one way. Sure. Sure, so currently it's a two-way street, um, which is fairly constrained from the roadway perspective. Um, the village does own property on either side of the street. Um, so rather than doing the earthworks that it would take to carve out sidewalk from where kind of on the sides of the street now, you could repurpose the roadway, make it one way, and use the other directions, that space that's used for that, and section that off for pedestrians and potentially cyclists. Okay, uh, any kind of final comments or big ideas? Because have, we have one more section we want to talk about implementation before we wrap up. Um, all right, so Michael, you want to talk about implementation? And thanks so much for your input, that was really helpful. Hi everybody. Um, so I'll, I'll be pretty brief. This is obviously a really exciting um, discussion and it's so uh, great to be with FHI Studio and to, to, to kind of hear all the ideas and the expertise of, of, uh, of your experiences. Um, so, you know, wanting to build on that energy, like what's next, what can happen? And, and again, actually, your village administrator, Jim, you know, has, uh, and your community has demonstrated that you guys have gotten things in, um, in the ground already to, to make the streets safer and better in terms of that that intersection at, at um, Midland and Masterton, as, as we see. So um, I think, you know, what would be the next steps as you move forward, right? These are just some of the, the bullets that, that come to mind um, to be thinking about, right? You want to kind of take this energy and think about selecting a plan or plans 
um, that you want to move forward with. And, and you won't really know which ones are going to be until you probably do a little bit more um, work with, with a, a number of groups, including the community. Um, and um, you know, thinking about building on the existing events, um, the walk to school week, or maybe it becomes a biannual thing and there's a fall walk to school week and a, and a spring walk to school week. And um, you know, some of the other events that, that Michael talked about when you think about safe routes to schools programs, um, whether that's, you know, again, tying it into education that's happening in the school, um, or work that can be done with the, with, with the police department and public safety officers about what are, you know, how, to, how to cross streets, as, you, uh, as, as, the, um, as they were saying, uh, you know, some issues around that. So there, we can kind of take some of the energy around. We want to make this, this community even more great and walkable than it already is. And, and how do we garner support? Here's an, here are some ideas we have, whatever those may be, neighborhood streets, one way, whatever the ideas are, crossings at, at, at White Plains Road. And we want to get more support for, for that and kind of tie that into existing events. Um, as was also mentioned, depending on who owns the road, you'll have to be <laughs> working with them uh, in, in terms of then needing to make these changes. Um, and beyond that, then identifying funding sources, whether they're through existing state programs, um, if they're things that can be folded into you know, other capital plans, everyone's holding their breath about what's gonna happen with the infrastructure bill. Um, so kind of identify that. And again, uh, um, the village is already aware of how to make these things happen, whether it's through certain grants, um, you know, the, the CMAC is the, the um, Congestion Mitigation and Air Quality, um, T is Transportation Alternatives uh, Program, um, and, and CFA is a, is, a, is a program through the state of New York that I'm sure the people here can uh, help identify. And then there are a variety of different things that you may not think would totally match, um, but the, if you read between the lines on some of these, there are state grants out there through both uh, the Department of Environmental Conservation and others um, that can be used to help advance um, the planning as well as the design and construction of, of these different community ideas. Um, and then the last step, of course, is finally getting that idea, whatever that concrete thing is, um, into, in, into engineering um, design and, and, and to being built. I also just want to quickly talk about um, what I, I would kind of make a distinction. I think we were talking about pilot projects before, but in some cases what, what may be um, uh, a better term um, for the idea of, well, let's, let's test it out for a, a week or whatnot. It might be a demonstration project. Pilot project is often usually thought of as when you use temporary materials, but for a slightly longer period of time. So the report is including, it's documenting all of your feedback. It'll be kind of anonymized feedback, so don't worry, it's not necessarily attached to you. But we're going to document all the feedback that we heard and start to get to the other some ideas, some of the research that Parker and I have been doing from the technical side of things. It will include um, two conceptual draft, conceptual renderings, um, one likely of kind of that section of Masterton around the curve, and then the other one at the crossing at Route 22. Um, these are draft concepts for discussion purposes. They're not final engineering designs. There's going to have to be another layer before anything, any shovels can go into the ground, in other words. It's, this is the start of a process. Not the, not the All right, thanks everyone.